house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Sorry, this afternoon. It's really great to be in God's house, <clears throat> worshiping Him today. I'd like you to just bow your heads with me and as we pray, ask God's blessings and direction as we look to His sacred book this morning. Father, we're so grateful for this great privilege to be here today. Thank you for your love that was there, there at the cross, granting us salvation, full and free. We have so much to be thankful for, so much to celebrate you about. And that's why we came today. And there's men and women and children and young people who have come simply to express our praise. But even more than that, we have come just to give to you our hearts. We pray, God, that you'll work a miracle in someone's life today. May they sing as we've just sung, victory belongs to you. May we leave here departing knowing that we have truly won the victory because we can truly overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Into your hands I commit myself to you. I pray that you might speak to me so that I might speak to your people. That you will instruct me so I might instruct your people. So that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The people of God say, Amen. 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 You may be seated. You may be seated. I want to thank your pastor for this privilege to be here this morning and just to share some words of encouragement. <laughs> I think at about 1.30, I have to run to a place called St. Thomas, which is about two and a half hours away from here, for a four o'clock assignment. Before I do, I'm going to share with you the Word of God. Not only thank your pastor, your senior pastor, but also your associate pastor, who always teases me. And so in his absence this morning, I will tease him and let, and let you know that he thinks he's older than me because he has all this gray hair. That's all right. We let him think that way. But I just wanted to share a gift. I wanted to thank uh, Pat, uh, Elder Donald for words of introduction, uh, for sharing a little bit of history. I'm thankful that you kept all of my personal secrets as a student to yourself. Please go to your great uh, client, uh, yeah, client, attorney client privilege. <laughs> But thanks so much for your introduction. It really is a privilege to be here fellowshiping with all the men in the room. Is there one man today who is celebrating your birthday this morning? Celebrating your birthday. I have a gift from the Youth Ministries Department. In front it says Youth Ministries on Terror Conference. And on the side it has our funky uh, little logo that says Adventist Youth Ontario. And uh, in the back it does say empowered to serve. That's the tagline for Ontario Conference Youth Ministries because the, the purpose of youth ministries isn't simply to have, this, have special occasions or to have special events, but that bottom line is to empower young people so that they might serve Christ. Can you say amen? amen. I want you to go ahead and give all of the young people a round of applause today. Who are here. to put your hands together and give a celebratory note to all the men in this room. Come on now, you can put your hands together. So I have this gift, I want to go ahead and it. Is there a man, a young man especially, if you are uh, celebrating your birthday today, or this weekend, this weekend, yes. Monday, come, 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 come and get your, come and get your t-shirt. When you come, you got to tell you what you Odin, everybody say hi, Odin. Hi, Odin. That's for you. God bless you. And I'll see you again. <laughs> Maybe next time I come, I can probably share a little bit more about youth ministries in Ontario Conference, but I'll digress. Let you know that we're doing a lot of stuff, and we're doing it for our young people so that they might serve Christ. I have uh, a team member here today with me. Her name is Tiffany. 
She had to run? Oh, she, okay, she's taking care of some business. All right, so Tiffany, Tiffany Barrow, let's put our hands together for her. She's going to probably walk out there. Uh, she serves up with, with me on the Youth Ministries Action Committee as our chair for team ministry, team ministry. I want you to take your Bibles in hand and turn to Joshua chapter 14. Joshua chapter 14. Now read in your hearing verse 10 through 12. And the Bible says, And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive. As he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now here I am this day, 85 years old, and yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me, just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Now therefore give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day, for you heard in that day how the Anakim were there, that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord has said. Now therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day, for you heard in that day how the Anakim were there, that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord has said. The topic of my brief message this morning is, give me this mountain. Stuck in the middle of the book of Joshua is this compelling story mixed with the dewdrops of tragedy and triumph. Sandwiched between the declaration, have I not commanded you to be strong and of good courage in chapter one. And the book ended at the back of the same dynamic book, these words penned by the trembling hands of the story teller. Joshua's last few words saying, serve, the Lord with your heart. Here in the midst of all the mayhem between conquering what was then known to be Canaan, conquering the kings, overcoming cities and towns as milestones of, of the places where God delivered, declared it is a land flowing with milk and honey. In the midst of all the conquering of all these kings and its consequent lands and then subsequently dividing them a portion to the entire region of Canaan into the 12 tribes of Israel. The writer of the book of Joshua pauses emphatically and parathetically to introduce the reader to some unfinished business. Now you would be forgiven if when you read this narrative, you had, ab you had absolutely no idea what the writer of the book of Joshua was talking about. You would not be blamed if you have not the slightest idea what Caleb's, the story of Caleb and his companions came to relay to Joshua, the leader of them, the children of Israel, was about. But it's quite simple, you know. The book of Joshua is divided into three parts. How many parts? Three. The conquests of the lands. Division of the lands. And of course, Joshua's final farewell to the people, the children of Israel. In this instance, Joshua has begun dividing, begun dividing the land into different segments according to the tribes of Israel. Sons and daughters of this tribe and sons and daughters of that tribe got theirs. These lands were sufficient for the children of Israel to be able to inhabit them and enjoy them for the rest of their natural life. These lands were promised to them, you see, by God. <clears throat> passed down through Moses, passed down through the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because, as they say, a promise is a promise. 
When I read this narrative in chapter 14, I don't get the sense that this cast of characters necessarily cares for all those sentimental things. As, Joshua, as good as they are, as Joshua turns to allocate the lands to the tribe of Judah, as has been his custom, something unusual happens. These persons come to Joshua not with their hands open, but from their hearts open, they have a strong, a very strong message to share with him. With this message, Joshua might have been well within his right to be surprised. The group in question is the tribe of Judah. But the person who rises from the midst of the group is none other than the person we've just read about, Caleb. He is tall, dark, and handsome like Idris Elba. The Bible describes him. Verse 6, that Caleb is the son of Jephna, of the Nazarite clan. Is this Caleb who comes along with the rest of the tribe of Judah to, to Joshua and before the leader of the children of Israel could even speak, he speaks the sentiments of the collective group. But by many view Caleb as a true Israelite, because his history would give you an understanding that Caleb is not necessarily of the tribe of Judah. Caleb was born with this Nazareth, this Nazite clan, and this clan attached themselves to the tribe of Judah. And back there in Numbers chapter 13 and chapter 14, here amongst all the tribes, the one representing the tribe of Judah is actually Caleb. Caleb was not a Seventh-day Adventist. He didn't attend Sabbath school class. He didn't go through the perfunctory Bible studies that many Adventists go through. He didn't listen to the sermons. He, he didn't pass through the cultural wars of the Seventh-day Adventist church. But somewhere, somewhere along the life, his life, he came to know who God is and came to give his life to God. So much the more that his level of conviction where God is concerned might have seemed greater than those around him. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? He was so strong in his devotion to God that a secondary meaning of Caleb's name is dog. One who followed his master. One who is faithful. One who is devotion is so paramount that that's all that he is devoted to. He's wholehearted in his faith. He's bold. He's brave. He's faithful. This is the basis uh, of, of the kind of person that is described as Caleb. Caleb is not simply interested in conquering lands. He's not simply interested in overwhelming more lands for land's sake. Caleb is not interested in finding and, and conquering and killing and subduing more kings. You see, Caleb is uncomfortable with his station in life. Not that where he is is a bad place necessarily. Not that the place that he has arrived does not demonstrate success. Not that the place to which he has claimed does not suggest that he can now relax, take a vacation, retire in his ripe old age of 85. But you see, Caleb, brothers and sisters, is simply dissatisfied. Is there any dissatisfied people in this room today? He's dissatisfied with the fact that nobody listened to him some 45 years ago. He's dissatisfied with the fact that his faith was not respected. He's dissatisfied with the fact that he was sent on an assignment to spy out the land and when he returned to give a favorable report, he thought it would be overwhelmingly received. He's dissatisfied with the fact that the people around him, all the people he associated with, did not have the same level of faith as he did. He's dissatisfied with the fact that the nations about which they were given to conquer was delayed in terms of their reception of it. He's dissatisfied that the God who he serves did not get to show up and to show off in a way that only God knows how to do. 
He's dissatisfied that the children of Israel did not come full circle to fix that egregious action of faithlessness. He's dissatisfied that the name of God and the power inherent in him was not appropriately vindicated. He's dissatisfied that the children of Israel lived by virtue of miracle after miracle and still they lived in complacency. He's simply dissatisfied. Trust me, brothers and sisters, you have been there when you have been completely and totally and absolutely dissatisfied. Do I have a witness in this house? You've been there when your dissatisfaction has led you to frustration. You've been dissatisfied when uh, that your dissatisfaction has led you to a corner to cry your eyes out at night. You've been there when your dissatisfaction has led you completely to give up the call that God has placed on your life. What you had set out to do, trust me, you've been there when you've been dissatisfied. Dissatisfied with your children. Dissatisfied with your spouse. Dissatisfied with the emptiness of your bank account. Dissatisfied with your job. And the fact that there is no upward mobility. Dissatisfied with empty promises like the one that Donald J. Trump often gives. That he never keeps. Some of you might be dissatisfied with your church, wondering why you're here. Everybody has experienced dissatisfaction a time or two across the spectrum of their own life. Why then must it be so different for Caleb? Now for him, dissatisfaction probably led to some sleepless nights. This dissatisfaction might have brought on some very uneasy dreams and, and nightmares. This unease gave way to contemplation, which opened the door to candid resolve in his heart. So much so that he should not, that he couldn't take it anymore. So he gathers all of his strength, gathers his courage and his confidence, and he walks boldly, boldly over to Joshua to deliver to Joshua what some might call a very life-threatening, life-altering proposition. Now, there are several ways of dealing with dissatisfaction, two of which are most salient. You can either give up on the situation, determining that nothing is going to change, or you could face the music with an indomitable spirit that defies the odds, that simply says, this situation, be it a life or death situation, and if I don't do something about it, if I don't have a strategy about it, if I don't rise beyond myself and commit to changing it, nothing is going to get done. Caleb does what most people wouldn't. Instead of taking the path of least resistance, taking the easy way out, instead of choosing the, to curl up and cry long crocodile tears in the corner, Caleb defies the odds and chooses a path less traveled. He goes to Joshua there in Gilgal, and, and with every fiber in his being, with every a fire shut up in his bones, he simply declares with one declarative, bold statement, give me this mountain. Now there comes a time when a man of God has to declare before the world, give me this mountain. There comes a time in your life when you have to make that kind of statement that differentiates yourself from everybody else. Men, when you are separated from men to boys, from boys to men, sorry, that's when you can declare, give me this mountain. There comes a time in the Christian walk when you have to have uncomfortable thoughts, make uncomfortable decisions, speak on comfortable declarative statements because if because of it you know very well that that some people are just not going to like you for it you know very well that what you have to do in order to save your marriage you know what you have to do brothers and sisters to save your children you know what you have to do in order to save your church you know what you have to do in order to save your livelihood in order to protect your family, there are just some things that you have to do, some things that you have to say, some decisions that you have to make in order for this circumstance to change. You know very well that they're not going to choose you for first elder next year 
because you have to make what would seem an unseemly decision. You know very well that you're not going to make any more new friends as a result of what you have to do. Your name won't be trending on Instagram anytime soon because of an unpopular thinking that you have to have and unpopular statements that you have to make and unpopular decisions that you have to choose. Nobody's going to be trending you anytime soon because you have decided to ask God to give you this mountain. <coughs> uh, Caleb says to Joshua, you know the word which the Lord says to Moses, the man of God concerning you and me and Kadesh Barnea. I was 44 year, 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back word to him as, as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. And, and so Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed God. In other words, Caleb is saying, brothers and sisters, I want to fulfill the promise that I made to God, because God has already fulfilled his promise to me. I, I was ready to stand up and fight back then. Why do you think I was a spy? Why do you think I gave my, my time and my efforts and my service to Moses and to God? Why do you, why do you think I, I agreed to be a spy? And then why do you think that when I came and returned, with a rosy report, I said, definitely we are well able to take this land. Because with God, we've got nothing, we've got everything, sorry, that we need to take this mountain. Amen. But nobody wanted to listen to me. I was one of the two men who came back saying, yeah, we can do this. But the other 10 men came back saying, no, nah, we're, 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 we're too small. We're just like grasshoppers. Two of us said there are signs that God is on our side, but they were determined not to follow God's promises. Two of us came back and said that while they, they saw us as grasshoppers, we saw them as grasshoppers in the eyes of God. Amen. Two of us came back saying that indeed the land is flowing with milk and honey, it's rich, it's it's wonderful, but 10 came back saying that while the land flows with milk and honey, we're not strong enough to overcome it. We came back saying that we have everything on our side. They came back saying that we ain't got nothing on our side. We came back saying that God can do the impossible, but they came back saying, who is God? Really, we should go back to Egypt. So A. Caleb declares, Give me this mountain that I was supposed to overcome some 45 years ago. How does he intend to take possession of this mountain? Brothers and sisters, I might, if I might be so bold to ask, who does Caleb think he is? What in the world is Caleb talking about? Trust me, I'd like to have what he's eating for lunch for, for him to be saying, at my ripe old age of 85, I could conquer the Anakim. What? Unfortunately, I'd probably be the first to say, give me some of other lands. Because there's no way, there's no way on God's green earth I'm going to go up and fight these big, tall, strapping men. Are you, are you kidding me? If I might be so bold to ask Caleb, Caleb, do you know what you're up against? Caleb, do you know who these men are? Caleb, do you know that these Anakim live on a hill and whatever fight you think you can have with them, for all intents and purposes, will be an uphill battle? Do you know that these Anakim have been so strategic that, that they've even built a city around them quite like a, the tall, the towering structures of today? Do you know, Caleb, that, that the Anakim are for a formidable race of giants whose penchant for war is unmistakable? Do you know that the Anakim could trace their ancestry back to Anak, the son of Arba, one who at that time was regarded as, I quote, the greatest man among the Anakim? Do you know, Caleb, that these Anakim's hands are thrice the size of the average man's hand? 
their head, their head some four times the size of the average human being. Their weight triple the times the weight of, the hu of humans, and their height well over 10 to 12 feet. These are tall, strong men who, who, who had war in their substance, who had war in their DNA. They lived to fight. They woke up fighting. They went to bed fighting. They, they dream of fighting when they're sleeping. After all, Caleb, this is not going to be an easy battle. This is not going to be a walk in the park. The place where he's speaking of is really a country, this countryside, which took them 40 days, 40 days to spy out years ago. It took you that long simply to spy. You're telling me that you could do it, you could fight these people in a much less time as you did spying them. You know? At the very top of this, of this mountain where these Anakim live, they have built structures around the four generals of the Anakims. These leaders are established on this hill. This hill was strategically placed, the, the, their palaces and their homes were strategically placed on a hill so that those who come to try to fight them would have to be going up rather than down to them. Caleb, whatever you're drinking, I hope that you have a designated driver. I should want to ask Caleb if he's the most strategic thinker right about now or if he's the most un uncurious, mumbling old man who has nothing better to do with his time than to join a quixotic adventure. Because it just does not make any sense to me why somebody would want to put their life in harm's way. Can I stop here and talk to you a little bit about who men are, ladies and gentlemen? Ladies, I don't know how true this is. But I have it on good authority that when you're looking for a man, you're looking for a man with some choice qualities. Are you, am I right? I heard that you're looking for a man who has good grooming. You're looking for a man who is assertive. Women don't like a man who's fickle of mind. You like a man who is charming, who has a charming personality. Someone who has a good physique. Of course, we mentioned the tall, dark, and handsome thing. Someone who has a good sense of humor. I feel like I'm talking to myself. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> a man who's not a pushover. Because a guy who's a pushover is one worst kind of man in the hierarchy of dating I've heard. And why am I only hearing from men saying, yeah? <laughs> you want a man who has a J-O-B. Yeah. I've heard the men were silent on that one. The ladies picked up the refrain. You want a man who has a good job, and a good, a nice salary. You want a man who's respected by others. You want a confident man. A confident man. You, you want a man who looks good. A good conversationalist. Someone who can hang with you when you have a conversation. As I heard that women speak about 24,000 words per day. And men, not so much. You want somebody who has respectful uh, uh, behavior. They say that you want someone who is an alpha male. Someone who knows how to handle his business, whatever his business is. You want a man who will make you feel comfortable in your skin. You want a, want a man who has a compatible personality. And we can go on and on surmising as to what women want. And I'm sure I can get about five witnesses in this room to come up here and demonstrate what is it, what it is that, that they want in a, in a man. But in other words, I heard that you want a man who is steady and structured and strong. I'm sure the men who would have, in this room would agree with you that these are great qualities to have. I'm sure the men would say to you that I may not be at that level 
in every stage. Don't give up on me. God is not finished with me yet. But can I be real with you this morning? Can I tell you that the strength of a man is not measured by how many times per week he goes to the gym? The strength of a man is not measured by how big his biceps and triceps are. The strength of a man is not measured by how many packs he's got ribbed on his abdomen. I have one pack. Some men strive for two and for six and for eight. The strength of a man is not measured by how many children he could father outside of the family that God gave to him. The strength of a man is not measured by how much heat he's got packing. The strength of a man is not measured by his job or his position or his physical stature or the depth of his bank account. Because oftentimes we men look at ourselves, then look at other men to see how we measure up, to see if we've arrived, to see if we're head and shoulders above the rest. We're called on in this society to be men of great intellect. We're called on to be men of ambition. We're called on to be men of strength. We're called on in today's society to be men of skill and, and health and vitality and virtue and mag magnanimity and, and conscientiousness. For the black man in this world, it's even worse. We have to push twice as hard, twice as much. We have to speak up twice as loud. We have to live twice as proud. Our work ethic has to be twice on point. Our speech has to be twice erudite. How we operate has to be perceived as twice above board. Our wife has to be twice the average woman. Our children have to be twice as brilliant. The mark we make in the world has to be twice as impressionable. And how we treat others in the world has to be twice as magnanimous. That does not say that others will look at what you have given twice as much as the average person and still disregard and dismiss what you have brought to the table like they did Barack Obama. As men in this world, despite the fact that we are flawed, and played with all manners of issues, we are still expected, brothers and sisters, to raise the bar. We're expected to step a bit higher, to a higher level. We're expected to be world changers. And all these will determine how strong we are. Can I talk to somebody today? While all these things might be good, while all these ideals might be right, I came to tell you this morning that the strength of a man is not measured by what he has on or in the bank, but what and whom he has in his heart, in his life, and in his mind. You see, there's something within me that holds the reins, something within me that banishes the pain, something within me I cannot explain. All I know that there is something within, deep inside of me, and that person is Jesus Christ, Amen. the best friend that anybody could have. Amen. Like Paul, we can declare, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives inside of me. The life which I now live, I live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. Caleb's strength was measured by how dusty his knees became because of his prayer life. Amen. His strength was measured by how large his heart had become because of the love that he had for the Lord. Amen. Caleb's strength was measured by how blind he became because of how much he studied the Word of God. And if the men of this, of this society and if men in this house of worship, if men right here who came today to be part of this fellowship, this worship service, you want to find strength. Your strength cannot be found in you. Your strength cannot be found in what you have brought to the table. 
Your strength cannot be found in your eruditeness and your intellect and, and all the things that you have brought. Your, your strength is not in your gifts and your talents, but your strength is found in Jesus Christ. So, so, so when you come to the point in your life like Caleb did, when he decided that the moment was right, when you come to that moment in life when you have to make a very uncomfortable decision, when you have to look at the lay of the land and recognize that your children need helping, that your home needs fixing, that your church needs to be loved, that the people whom you know needs encouragement, that the boy and the girl on the street needs to be enriched, that the young men at our, in our high schools need a mentor who needs to be mentoring them into manhood. But when you have come to the place when you recognize that there are mountains that you need to cross, you need to say as a man of God, give me this mountain. Yeah. Caleb did not regard his human might. He didn't regard his human prowess. He didn't regard his intellect and all of his abilities. No, no, no. He recognized that his strength was in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he could say with confidence, I'm looking at something that seems impossible, but I want it. I want to know if there's 39 people in this house who will declare today, I want it. Touch three people next to you and say, I want it. I want my husband back. I want my wife back. I want my children back. I want my church back. I want my community back. I want the kingdom of God back. I want it back. Whatever the devil stole from me, I want this mountain. And I'm well able to take it. Come with me. It doesn't matter what somebody has to say about me. You might laugh at me. You might snicker at me. You might will do a quirk at me. You might say some funky stuff about me, but I just don't care because I have a just don't care attitude because I know where I've come from. I know the 45 years of hell that I've gone through. I know the problems and the struggles that I face. I know the people that I've passed by. I know the God whom I serve and the boldness that is inside of me is much more than your laughs. Much more than your snickers. Much more than your conversation behind my back. I could care less what you have to say. Because I've declared before God that my hope is in God. And my life is in His hands. And this mountain that I passed by some 45 years ago is now mine for me to have. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Some of you might be facing your mountains this morning. You might be facing your dawning challenges in your life. But because you are human, you have the, the, the tendency to look at your circumstance, weigh them against your abilities as to how to fix what ails you, and realize that you think you can do it by yourself. And so you look at your health. Gentlemen, your health is broken. You can't handle the stuff in your room, in your bed at night with your wife anymore. This is a men's conference, right? <laughs> That's a reality in our communities. And there's a whole lot of stuff that I can say about that. About the stuff that we eat and the way we live our lives. Stuff that is on TV that, that, that entices us, that reduces our manhood. Your life is broken. Your marriage is tossed. Your home is wrecked. You can't find inner peace. You're dealing with phobias of all kinds. Fears, trepidation, fear of heights, fear of people, fear of things, fear of seeing. You feel unloved. Your job is not secure. Your life is full of depression. You feel like you've been a failure. You, you lack self-esteem. You lack self-confidence. You walk into the room and you, and, and, and you hide behind everybody else. You stick yourself to the back of the wall so that nobody can see you or hear you. 
you can't give because your job is a mess. You go to work and your boss has more work than you have time. And what they're paying you at the end of the month is just a gas gift. Your bank account is all but dry up. And, and, and as men, we have been played with this flaw that we must fight by ourselves. We have a tendency to, to suggest to ourselves that we have it, that we are the source of all power, the source of all strength. That we have the, the gifts to fix what, what's happening in our lives. But brothers and sisters, if we look at our abilities and weigh them against the circumstances that are arrayed against us, we then recognize that we will fail. But Caleb, brothers and sisters, doesn't do that. Caleb looks at the circumstance that is arrayed against him. He looks at his abilities that he knows that he has. He's been a man of war. He has conquered kings. He's gone into situations where, where life and death and he declares in verse 10, he says, And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive all of these 40 years. I have seen it with my own eyes. I've experienced it at, as a person, as an individual. I've seen it all. He's weighed the circumstances against his abilities. And he recognizes that him by himself is an utter failure. Him by himself is just him by himself trying to fight a losing battle. But then he looks at his circumstance. He looks at his problem. He looks at that mountain that is so insurmountable. He looks at the giants. He, look, he looks at the four annex. And then he looks at his abilities. And he says, I'm switching my abilities with God's abilities. Sometimes as a people of faith, as a people of faith, our bold proclamation of faith is what will initiate the kingdom of hell being shaken loose in its boots. You remember the three Hebrew boys who says, yeah, we got it. But the man upstairs got it more than us. We don't serve you, okay? Except we serve God who's above you, okay? If God desires to deliver us, he will, but if not, we're still going to worship him and have faith in God. It's your declaration, your bold statement that begins to initiate the hands of God. I'm, I came to let you know somebody that you need to begin declaring into the atmosphere, into the face of your enemies, into the face of the world, into the face of this society. I am going to take it back. Are you able to say that the Lord is my shepherd? I shall not want. Your bold declaration, are you able to say that the Lord is my shield? and buckle against the arrows that fly by day. Are you able to say that the Lord is my rock, a shelter in the time of storm? Are you able to say that the Lord is my refuge and my strength and my fortress, a very present help in time of trouble? Are you able to say that the Lord offers a dwelling place that in the secret place of the Most High you can actually dwell? Are you able to say that the Lord offers his angels to take charge over you? Because the angels of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. Caleb's bold statement is, I know that I'm 85 years old. But the Lord has kept me alive. Ever since the Lord has spoke this word to Moses while Moses... While Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now I'm here. Caleb's declaration is threefold. I'm, I've waited for this time. I'm 85 years old. Number two, 
I'm still strong. As yet I'm strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. What he's saying is that I still have the aptitude. But the difference between me then, me, me now and then is like fine wine. And I know most Adventist folk don't drink wine. But, but, but they say that wine becomes better as the years pass by. <laughs> he says, I'm 85 years old. I'm still strong. And with the same confidence of yesteryear, with the same set of faith that I have, I could take the anarchy. Give me this mountain. Andy Rooney once said, he says, everyone wants to live on the mountain tops. But all the happiness and the growth occurs while you're climbing the mountain top. Yeah. Well, when I look at the text, I, I, you know, the, the, the Bible is often interesting. It, it gives you, it gives you some, some descriptions as to how things unfolded. But as I continue reading the text, in verse, from verse 12 to 13, it doesn't really say what happened. So I have to use my spiritual imagination to find out what happened. You, you see, I'm actually glad <clears throat> that there's no details in terms of how he overcame the giants. Because as good Adventists, we would try to take that formula and superimpose it on everybody and everything else, saying that this is the only method and the only way that we could get it done. Are you with me today? Yeah. But aren't you glad that the how God is working in your life? Can I talk to somebody today? is different than the how he's working in somebody else's life. How God works in your life might be different from the way God is working in my life. But that does not mean that he's not working in yours. And it doesn't mean that he's not working in mine. But what it does mean is that when you think you're not seeing stuff happening in my life, and you're quick to judge and criticize and marginalize and demonize, Know that God is doing something inside of me. <clears throat> when you see something that appears to be unseemly and distasteful and disfigured, it is because God is transforming something in my life. And if you see me appearing to be hard-pressed on every side, that may be so, but I'm not crushed. It might appear to you that I am perplexed, but trust me, I'm not in despair. It might appear that I am persecuted, but I'm letting you know that I'm not forsaken. I might seem struck down, but hallelujah to the Lamb of God, I'm not destroyed. That's because God is doing something powerful in me that with your human eyes, you might think unseemly and distasteful, but God is working in me both to will and to do of his great pleasure. It took a week to lay the moon and stars, the sun and moon and Jupiter and Mars, but how lovingly patient he must be that God is still working on me. most we can do as a people of faith is to give an encouraging word. A encouraging word to, or to offer a prayer, of a solemn prayer. The most we can do when we see God working in people's life is to be a helping hand, to be a loving heart, to be a shoulder to cry on. And men, it is okay to shed some tears. Because if you don't shed tears, you're going to pop one of these days. God is calling us to be a mouth that blesses rather than curses. I'm so glad that there's no formula as to how Caleb overcame the giants. But one thing I do know is that a mil military expedition always has a military strategy. I looked at military strategies across the centuries, but I discovered that while I cannot de delineate all the military strategies, uh, 
from beginning to end, there's one key thing that allows for a strategy to be successful. Do you want to hear it? Yes. That one thing is always central. Do you want to hear it? Yes. It is called the commander yeah. in chief. Amen. If you know what God I serve, if you understand the person that we call God, I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, he might appear to lose some battles. But God always wins the war. I'm not sure what military strategy Caleb used. Doesn't really say it. You know what? I was just born in 1975, so I wasn't really there. But I could use, but, but, but what, what I can understand about his strategy is based on a man of God who says that I'm in love with Jesus. Caleb says, I'm a seasoned warrior. He's battle tested. He's seen the battle up front and personal. He's seen brothers in arms die right by his side. But he discards all of the memories of that and he, he comes and he says, this is my strategy to gain this mountain. The first that we have to understand in gaining the mountains in our lives is number one, we all got giants. Caleb was like, listen brothers and sisters, I faced all kinds of giants. What is this giant? What are these giants that I have to pay such homage to them? We all will face our own giants. We'll all face hardships, seemingly insurmountable obstacles, temptations. We'll have problems, we'll have temptations, we'll have all kinds of stuff. Those are our giants. But to recognize that when we're in the battle with the giants, when we're saying that we've got to face the mountain, when we're saying that we're going to capture the mountain, recognize that you're not capturing the mountain by yourself. Here's what he says in verse 12. He says, Now therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord promised and spoke in that day. For you heard it in that day how the Anakim were there and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be, it may be, it may be, it may be that the Lord will be with me. And because of that, I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord has said. Amen. Is there anybody who can declare with their declaration that the Lord is with you? Amen. Is there anybody who can say that this mountain, this battle, this circumstance is not mine, but it's God's? That this problem that I'm struggling with, this pain that I'm bearing, this, this issue that I'm facing, this is not mine to bear. Brothers and sisters, God is saying, come unto me, all those who labor and are heavy laden. And I want to do a divine human exchange with you. I want you to take your yoke off of you and put it on me and take my yoke from me and put it on yourself. Because the battle is not yours, but it is God's. Whatever strategy that God wants you to take to defend yourself, to fight against the giants, God has actually cleared the way for you to succeed in your life. You see, the problem for us as Christians is that we tend to face our giants in front of us and say that we're by ourselves when God is the one who called us to face those giants. He's given us levels of faith. He's given us courage. He's given us confidence. He's given us a heart. He's, he's given us the kind of life that will bring pleasure and glory to his name. 
and replaces those giants in our lives and in our way. He says, go with God. But the last one says, you've got to trust in God. Because you see, when you are facing those giants, are you all still with me? And you're not facing those giants by yourself. And because the battle is not yours, but it's God's. What God says in terms of your stance is not your going forward to where the giants might be. But he's saying, I want you to do something that would be contradicting what you would normally do. I want you to stand back and see the salvation of God. Stand back and see God work a miracle in your marriage, brothers. Stand back and see God work a miracle in your finances. Stand back and see God work a miracle in your hearts. Stand back and see God work a miracle in your health. Stand back and see God work a miracle on your job, on your boss. Stand back and see God work a miracle in your community. Stand back and see God work a miracle in your children, in your family, in your home. Stand back and see God turn things upside down for your good, but ultimately for the glory of God. See this morning, give me this mountain, whatever that mountain may be. Whatever be tied, Jesus will be with you. You might be struggling with whatever mountain. Take that mountain as God tells you to take it. And go with him wherever he leads. You know, Caleb, as you stand to your feet, is a type of Christ. You see, Caleb's experience is almost prophetic. Because Caleb represents Jesus who went up against a mountain of sin. A mountain of Satan. A mountain of despair. He too made a bold statement to give me Golgotha's hill. You might not want to call him old, but you definitely have to call him the Ancient of Days. In my infinite thought, my finite thoughts, sorry, I could, could imagine the Godhead anticipating the mountains that, of sin and degradation and Satan and, and despair and despondency. I can imagine God sitting around the celestial table there in his divine palatial palace where an array of, of challenges confronted him. Who will go and grab this mountain of sin and shame and iniquity? So he takes a look around the canopy of history and he looks and he sees Adam. Adam couldn't do it because Adam brought sin into the world. He looked at Noah and he saw Noah, but Noah couldn't do it because Noah was full of fear and trepidation. He looked at Abraham and Abraham couldn't do it because Abraham lied and cheated his way. He looked at Moses and Moses couldn't do it. He looked at Joshua and Joshua couldn't do it. He looked at David and David couldn't do it because he slept with Bathsheba and had her husband killed. Esther couldn't do it. Then he said to himself, who could I send? Then he looked at himself. And he looked at the expressed image of the Father. He says, from this, I will develop an insurance policy. Well before the foundations of the world. I'll, I'll condescend and fashion myself in the form of human flesh. I'll get the Spirit of God to plant a seed into the Virgin Mary. I'll, I'll increase in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man and be baptized in the Jordan River. 
I'll go to every village and every town and every city, turning it up them upside down by my healing power. I'll ask them questions that will twist them into pretzels to the Pharisees, that is. I'll allow them to take me captive where they will beat me up, where they will spit on me, when the chastisement of their peace will be on my shoulders, but by my stripes they will be made whole. I'll be obedient to the cross. I'll go up to that hill. I'll demand that that hill be mine. Spikes will be thrust through my hands and nails through my feet. Trust the spear into my side, and I'll declare that it is finished. I'll breathe my very last breath. I'll lay in the tomb from Friday night. The stamp of Herod will be against the grave. And the angels of darkness will move beyond thinking that I am no more. I will psych them out for the entire weekend, but I will hear my master's voice calling me. And on Sunday morning, I will rise once again. And I will snatch the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And declare that I have conquered this mountain. If Caleb could declare, give me this mountain. If Jesus could declare, give me this mountain of Golgotha. You can take your hands. You don't need to be at a gym to see how strong you are. In your weakness, God's strength is made perfect. Doesn't matter how strong you think you are. Doesn't matter how much brain power you might have. Doesn't matter how much you have brought to the table with you. How many gifts and talents. Doesn't matter what side of the tracks you were born, out of which family you were born, whether you were baptized in it or dedicated in it, whether you knew God from 50 years ago or you just found out about God now, I came to let you know that there is no mountain that you cannot climb. There is no sea that you cannot cross. There is no problem that is too impossible with you because with God, all things are possible. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. Who today will say, give me this mountain. I don't know what your mountain that you have to say, give me. I don't know who you might have on top of that mountain. I don't know which annex you might have. But God is looking for holy boldness from God's people. God is looking for holy boldness from God's men. Who are willing to rely not on one strength, but on the strength of the Lord. Father. Our mountains are yours. We're not going to fight, our, fight the giants by ourselves. We're not going to overcome them simply because the world says that we have to by ourselves. No, no. We're going to let you do it. Only the way that you can. Only by your power. so 
sometimes reluctantly. Not knowing how it's going to turn out. Not knowing how it will all be fixed. That Caleb push aside everything else. Say this mountain that I could have climbed years ago. Same level of confidence that he demonstrated throughout the course of his life. 